Hello, it's always a pleasure to be back right here on Today with Zamto. I am Kalumba Skonde, and this is the special series, The Road to Independence, as we celebrate 50 years of Zambia's freedom. In this episode, our field presenter, Patience Chisanga, will take us on a journey to Nyasaland, which is present-day Malawi, and then to southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and back to northern Rhodesia, which is present-day Zambia, as we take a look at the rationale and, indeed, the makeup of the Federation between 1953 and 1963. That story is coming up in detail right after this message from your indigenous and communication network provider of choice. Zamtel, stay with us. I feel so happy, man. Life is good. Top of the old title. Let me tell you about this feeling, man. Ah. He feeling in Imbama. Boy, he feeling in Imbama. What? Nefen te ufa ten kama. Sam te uba kamba te avan. You were fuchin a fuchi. You were fuchin a fuchi. I'm a cousin in Chiba. But the quality fuchi. The quality fuchi. Kiri a tishani. Olofea puroti. Roaming a tishani. Sam te uba kamba. Eira ina tutirati. Zamtel, live life today. It's a bright morning in the city of Harare. The characteristic sounds of a modern metropolis. This is the city that was known as Salisbury, the capital of the Federation of Rhodesia and Yasaland. Hello, Kalumba, and hello, viewers. Welcome to another informative edition of Today with Zamtel on the Road to Independence series. This week, we focus on the rationale and makeup of the Federation of Rhodesia and Yasaland. In this episode, we will see how the selfish motives of the colonial governments affected northern Rhodesia, present-day Zambia, Nyasaland, present-day Malawi, and how southern Rhodesia, present-day Zimbabwe, benefited from this exploitation. The Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, also known as Central African Federation, consisted of three Southern African territories. The three countries were at different political and economic development levels. Northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland were designated as British protectorates. The countries were to be administered and prepared for eventual self-rule. Southern Rhodesia, however, was a settlement and had the highest population of whites. This was an imperial scheme uh, to make uh, bigger regions out of small countries, to make management of government easier by Britain. Rhodesia became, uh, was becoming a colony, self-governing, with a prime minister, with a cabinet from elected members of parliament under their franchise system. Um, Northern Rhodesia was a protectorate directly under the British. Um, civil servants formed the Executive Council together with some nominated members. The settlers here felt that this was dangerous for them. So they were fighting for amalgamation with Southern Rhodesia. And, uh, but Southern, there were people in Southern Rhodesia, whites in Southern Rhodesia, who didn't really like it because Northern Rhodesia was poor and it would be a burden uh, on their resources, you know, the economy was doing well for them. And so bringing in these northern, poor northern Rhodesians would have a problem. They would have a problem. There was something else, uh, because this was a protectorate, the um, civil service had some Africans coming in uh, in the administration. And the white Rhodesians didn't like that because some of the jobs being done by Africans in Northern Rhodesia were actually preserved for Europeans in Southern Rhodesia. And uh, so that became a bit of a problem for them uh, to right away go into amalgamation. But it was almost succeeding. Um, but there was also a problem uh, of a declaration, which initially was for Kenya, uh, that where the interests of the settlers and those of the natives were in conflict. 
the interests of the natives would prevail. And, and that uh, was not going down well among the settlers because they knew their numbers were small. Malawi was even more difficult because Malawi was regarded as too poor. And so it, become, it would actually add a, a bigger burden uh, on them, except that it was good as a source of labor uh, for the farms and the mines in both in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in southern Odisha and, 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 and northern Odisha. So there were a few things which were working in favor of our Africans, uh, which worked against amalgamation. But because the, the whites were absolutely determined to strengthen their control uh, and entrench their interests in this country uh, and, and, and southern Odisha and Nyasaland, they hatched a federal idea. In order to achieve the intentions of creating a federation, series of conferences were held between 1945 and 1952. It took nearly three years for the federation to be established. A referendum was held in southern Rhodesia, which decided in favor of the creation of the federation. It was inaugurated in 1953. Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia, and Nyasaland united through the order in the council the same year. This was done despite massive African opposition to it. Although exponents of the federation talked of it as a partnership between Africans and the white settlers, some federal government officials referred to it as a partnership between a horse and its rider. When the federation was finally established, it had five branches of government, one federal, three territorial, and one British. This often translated into confusion and jurisdictional rivalry among various levels of government. According to some writers, it proved to be one of the most elaborately governed countries in the world. Sir Godfrey Huggins became the first prime minister from 1953 to 1956, followed by Sir Roy Walensky, a prominent Northern Rhodesian politician from 1956 to the Federation's dissolution in 1963. Malawi, one of Africa's smallest countries, sandwiched within the borders of Tanzania, Mozambique, and Zambia. It was one of the three countries to be included in the Federation of Northern Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia, and Nyasaland. Unlike the other two countries, Malawi was geographically small but had a dense population. It was this population that the federal government exploited for labor. The pressure came from the settlers here and also the British government. Because they, uh, they believed that if Nyasaland joined the federation, it would be, its budget would be subsidized by the federation. So Northern India at that time was actually cash cow of the central federation. It was prosper to talk of Mfulira, Kitwe. It was to talk of an El Dorado. Northern India was so prosperous. So white settlers all over, of course, accepted the Nyasa to be part of the federation because when they visited, they found uh, there were resources here, agricultural resources, quite remarkable. Uh, tourism. Nyasa was seen more as a, a source of labor and a market for South India products. You know, South India was having secondary industries and they were dumping them here. The traditional factories, they just had warehouses and, and they would say made in Yasa, and, but they, they meant just you know, screwdriver type of manufacturing. Things were manufactured in Salisbury. But the Zambians were very correct to say our country is being milked. They were very good. The wealth of Zambia was being taken to Salisbury. Those lofty buildings you see there, it was copper mine mostly. Uh, they have promised that uh, the wealth would spread to, to Nyasa as well. But when the money came here, they just built white men, people's houses and so forth. It only benefited white people, not Africans at all. So the country that benefited the most was Southern Asia. The economy of Malawi, then Nyasaland, was largely agricultural, with tea as a major cash crop. 
Towards the end of the 1950s, the vast lands of Malawi had been transformed into European tea plantations where Africans labored. Now, even though the inclusion of Malawi into the Federation was more of a symbolic gesture, the tea plantations were exploited to shape the future economic developments of the Federation. Since time immemorial, tea planting has continued here at the foot of Mount Mulanje. From Mount Mulanje, you can see spectacular views of the Malawi tea plantations. Today, tea is the country's second biggest export crop. This is the very first parliament building which is located here in Zomba. Zomba was for a very long time the colonial capital of British Central Africa, which was later to be known as Nyasaland, present-day Malawi. In 1953, the Legislative Council, based here in Zomba, formally voted for the Federation of Northern Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Hotel Masongola was established in 1886. In 1886, however, it was not established as a hotel. It then served as the official residence of the first commissioner of Nyasaland. His name was Sir Harry Johnston. Sir Harry Johnston established his home here in Zomba, saying Blantyre was pretty, but Zomba was more beautiful. Now, Hotel Masongola houses the very first office of the first president of Malawi, Dr. Hastings Kamuzo Banda. He occupied the office in 1964 when Malawi attended its independence. Let's get to see what remains of his office. Now, this office serves as the office for the manager of Hotel Masongola. For a very long time, Zomba was the headquarters of almost all government departments. It was commonly understood that Southern Rhodesia would be the dominant territory in the Federation, economically, electorally, and militarily. The dominant role played by the European population in Southern Rhodesia is reflected in that played by its first leader, Sir Godfrey Huggins. He was the Prime Minister of the Federation for its first three years and before that he was the Prime Minister of Southern Rhodesia for an uninterrupted 23 years. Southern Rhodesia played a very key role. Uh, the British were interested very much to have all the white people, all the Europeans at that time, to be more in Southern Rhodesia. So, from 1953, 54, uh, just as they were about to start the Federation, the government in Southern Rhodesia made a good propaganda for all the Africans in Southern Rhodesia whose land had been designated to be, to be called the European land in, in, in the future. And those who felt that the land they had was, was poor, they were told that we have huge tracts of land and you have this for free eh, across the Zambezi. You go to Northern Rhodesia. So a lot of Zimbabweans, black Zimbabweans, were heavily encouraged to migrate to northern Rhodesia. And the way they did it was the very smart way. They said, look, there are plenty of cattle there. So what you're not taking uh, is, the li is the livestock, sell. Then you buy the livestock across the Zambezi. But all your household belongings, you shall put them on the train for free. 
and they were taken right across to Zambia for free. And the people just said, well, this is wonderful, for free. And, uh, and therefore they were, so it was the translocation exercise was very attractive. In the meantime, they were doing the same with the whites in uh, northern Rhodesia and in Yasaland, saying it is important that all the white people, unless those who have uh, public service duties in uh, northern Rhodesia and the Yasaland, they uh, can stay a little longer. But all those who seek business, who seek any, any prosperity, welcome to Southern Rhodesia. Now, you could see from that time, anything that had to do with the uh, Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland was all the institutions pertaining to the three countries were all located in Southern Rhodesia. The University of Rhodesia and the Yasaland, for example, when it started, it was started in 1955. And uh, all the, the, the whole administration was really done, all the Federation of Rhodesia and Yasaland. Uh, the governor uh, was uh, located in Salisbury. So, because it was the, Salisbury was the capital for the Federation of Rhodesia and the Yasaland, that's they developed Southern Rhodesia uh, faster and more uh, in comparison to uh, Northern Rhodesia and the Yasaland. The modern and sophisticated infrastructure of present day Harare is testimony to how Southern Rhodesia benefited economically from the Federation. The central economic motives of the Federation of Rhodesia and Yasiland was to utilize the abandoned copper deposits in northern Rhodesia, which is present-day Zambia, and exploit the labor of Nyasiland, present-day Malawi. The Federation is said to have been an economic success, at least at the start. There was investment in a few expensive engineering projects, such as the Kariba Hydroelectric Dam on the Zambezi. The creation of the Kariba Hydroelectric Power 